Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our family and friends updates. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Petronella Ndebele, and I'm the Director of Strategic Communications and Stakeholder Relations. I'll be facilitating today's program. It has been 13 years since my family and I came to Canada, a place we now call home. We continue on a journey of learning and reflecting on the history of this country. And now I'd like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with Mississaugas of the Credit, and the William Street is signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We also acknowledge that we are all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants either in this generation or in generations past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Today, we pay tribute to the ancestors of those of African and indigenous origin and descent. It's great to be here today with all of you. Before we begin our meeting, there are a few housekeeping items to go over. We ask that you please use the Q&A function to make a comment or ask a question. You'll notice the agenda. That's going to be on the screen shortly. We have a lot to share with you today. Kindly let me now know if you're experiencing any technical issues, and I'm sure me now has put her contact details in the chat. Atam Perederi will be the one controlling the slides today, so if you are presenting, kindly ask him when you need slides to be changed. Without further delay, I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Joe Pesod, Senior Director, Community Participation Support and Respect, to provide an update in their program area. Joe, over to you. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Petty, and welcome, everyone. I'll just jump right into the presentation and move to the next slide, please. Uh, so here are some highlights on uh, um, including some constructive feedback we've received it uh, so far. So I'll just talk a little bit about this slide. So after offering our redesigned CPS model in the summer, we began our fall session on October 10th. And that session will run until December 23rd. And that's in our new 12 week cycle. Um, along with our virtual and fee-for-service options, we have welcomed back people who are in funded spaces for those residing in family homes, uh, those residing in supported living with other uh, agencies, and those living on their own to register for the programs of their choice across the city at our eight locations. The feedback we've received so far includes folks enjoying a large variety of program offerings, the opportunities to socialize, the instructor-led offerings like Zumba, bingo, trivia, music, cooking, and baking classes are all very popular. We've also heard from you about things like wanting more time in the program, longer session cycles, and uh, transportation challenges. And we will continue to work on these challenges and look for creative solutions to improve for each session offering. And as you know, those living in CLTO supported living or group homes are being supported 24 seven in their homes with meaningful activities throughout the day, evenings uh, and weekends. As well, they have the options to access CLTO center-based um, locations, that's our CPS locations on a bookable basis and or they could access their community at large for their CPS activities of choice. So, lots of uh, choice uh, in with along with our folks living in our supported living environments and we continue to work with our supported living leadership and staff teams to continue to increase the use of our bookable spaces across the city and partner on collaborative program activities at our centers next slide please so this slide basically is a brief summary of our increasing numbers registered for each session so far uh, you'll see the spring, summer, and fall. And if you look across the board at each 
uh, point we're increasing, which is a great sign that people are, are coming back and registering. So if your family member is in a funded center-based space, but not yet to register for a program, please contact us and we will be happy to assist you with the registration process on my community hub if you need that support. And if you do not presently have a funded space and are interested in fee-for-service options using your passport or other sources of funding, please visit my community hub or reach out to us and we would be happy to help you with the registration process too, if needed. Also, you can find the CPS Fall Experience Guide on our website anytime you would like to refer to it. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a quick summary. I think we presented on this before, but it's a good reminder that these are resources that we have for folks to make the experience uh, of finding uh, information and resources much easier. You'll see our Fall Experience Guide, as I mentioned, is on our website. You can access anytime and we continue to build our activity library on connectability. And if you haven't yet, I welcome you to check it out on connectability.ca. And we would love to get your feedback on the resources that we've posted there. And as I mentioned, the bookable spaces, we've set up a system where our supported living teams can access and book spaces at our centers. And we are close, very close to launching our CPS microsite to improve the online experience for easier navigation. So look out for an announcement coming soon in November about the microsite. Next slide, please. So coming soon, uh, uh, first uh, an opportunity arose that we took advantage of for an early exit to our lease uh, with the TDSB at our Gooderham site. And this is scheduled at the end of December uh, that we are planning to actually leave Gooderham and we'll be moving uh, our operations to the Fairfax location. We are working closely with our property scheme to prepare the space to welcome the Gooder and folks and staff to Fairfax. And here's what you see there on your screen right now is a list of improvements we'll be completing in advance of uh, the move that will benefit both uh, Fairfax and Gooderham supported people and staff teams. So we're very excited about this and uh, We'll give you more updates as we progress to the move and after the move. Um, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, this is just a high level reminder about the key aspects of the new model focused on choice with respect to location, community, uh, day, evening, and weekend options, and how they can use their 15 hour, that's folks uh, coming, how they use their 15 hour service blocks in three or five hour uh, program options. Next slide, please. And this is very exciting. Uh, for those of you who live in Scarborough or attended and heard about the mix, um, it, it basically is a community club where all are welcome to come out and enjoy an evening of entertainment, usually with a band, a dance or other events to show lives with friends old and new. Uh, the mix was successfully run for 20 years by a group of committed volunteers and like everything else was paused when the pandemic hit us in 2020. Um, these monthly events will now be led by CLTO's CPS staff. So we adopted the program will be run out of the CPS uh, umbrella uh, with support of newly onboarded CLTO volunteers from CHEERS, that's Community Head Injury Resource Services and CLTO to continue offering entertainment people have left for years. And we are happy to start the mix back up now at Fairfax and look to plan similar events at our other locations around the city as we try to create opportunities and events for people to reconnect with their old friends. And we've heard from folks that uh, with this new model, there's a there possibly is a disconnect between those who are living in our group home that used to come on a you know five days a week basis are missing their friends. So this is a model we hope to uh, uh, spread across the city and offer our other locations. And fresh off the presses, I heard from Heather Dunn from our first event this past Friday night. Um, and it was a huge success. I'm quoting Heather. It's a huge success by all accounts with a live band, dancing, snacks, and, and uh, with old and new friends. We had approximately 65 to 70 people supported with 12 volunteers and lots of support staff and lots of happy people to have to be back together again. And the next event, as you see there, will be a big band with a holiday theme and all are welcome to register and join the fun. 
Next slide, please. And our standard My Community Hub slide, uh, you'll have that to refer afterwards in the recording, but this is where you would uh, register for the CPS programs that I've mentioned. And then the next slide is uh, if you wanted to connect with us, you're having difficulty, you have questions, here's how you connect with us that we can help you uh, with your questions and, and registration process. And there's email and phone number for you to connect with us. Now I will move to our respite choices. Thanks, Betty. Uh, because everyone needs a short break, right? Um, we provide families, caregivers, and people we support with opportunities for short breaks to allow everyone to refresh and focus on themselves. These short breaks are intended to be flexible, foster social and emotional supports, promote independence with activities that teach life skills and incorporates lots of fun in the learning process. Next slide, please. So our children's respite programs are offered at two locations, uh, Lawson in the east and Ennerdale in the west from Monday to Thursday during the school year. There are three sessions that cover the duration of the school year in three month booking blocks, September to December, January to March, April to June. And please connect with us next month for the next booking cycle that runs up till March, 2024. Next slide, please. And here's a slide I, again, shown before, but it's a good reminder if folks uh, are looking to connect with us. It also outlines the eligibility requirements um, for Lawson and Respite, sorry, Lawson and Ennerdale, respectfully. Next slide, please, just flying along here. Um, so now the adult respite programs, a, a lot of uh, change happening with adult respite and really excited about uh, this program being uh, looked to restart out of Sibley in, in this new model where it's dedicated units where we able to offer adult respite versus in uh, guests in folks uh, homes in terms of previously how we offered in group homes. So the newly renovated uh, Sibley site uh, will be doing uh, intake starting soon with bookings for respite, adult respite for December 22nd, that's our plan. You'll see the eligibility requirements uh, for adult respite specifically and the address in case you need a reminder of where we're located in terms of Sibley site we've had for a very long time, but it's brand spanking new. And the next slide is um, outlines, you know, I mentioned this brand spanking new in terms of the renos. Um, we'll have an open house on November 7th. It'll run from 11 to 7. And uh, please consider coming out for a tour, meeting our teams, get your questions answered, and enjoy some light refreshments. And the next slide, please. Well, again, I think I've shown this slide before, but it's a nice kind of, hey, come and visit us at the open house. Uh, this is a sneak peek of some photographs. So the space is now bright, refreshed, and what you can expect to see if you come out for the open house and it's much more impressive in person. And I think the next slide is my final slide. And here's the contact information for respite choices at CLTO. Uh, the individual contact information for our leadership team also. So you have the general, you have our individual leadership teams, and please don't uh, hesitate to reach out to us in whatever manner that is most convenient for you or your family members to have your questions answered or support that you may need. Uh, thank you. I think that those are my slides. Thank you so much, uh, Joe, for providing uh, information on the program offerings, resources uh, you are sharing, and many exciting upcoming uh, events. And we hope to see some of you on November 7th at the Sibley Parkview. And please do get in touch with the team if you need more information. The contact details are displayed there. Thank you so much, Joe. October is Disability Employment Awareness Month, and at Community Living Toronto, we believe a job is more than just work. It is a source of purpose and a place of belonging. It gives people an income and can lift them out of poverty, empowering them to realize their full potential.
I would like to invite Sarah McDonald, Executive Project Manager, Social Enterprise and Employment Projects, to present on My Job Match, our innovative service which brings together employers, job seekers with a disability, and employment support professionals to track, match, and secure meaningful job opportunities. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Petronella. Good morning, everybody. Oh, good afternoon, actually, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, this time. I can present to you my job match. Um, next slide. So before we jump into the specifics, I wanted to give you a bit of a background on why my job match was created. Um, and we can go as far back as 2016 when our Auditor General observed that Ontario's employment and training programs were not efficient in helping job seekers find or retain employment. So what they did in 2019 is they initiated a transformation of Ontario's employment services. And really this came down to three big shifts. The first major change was really to streamline the current employment pathways. There were three, they've rolled those into one, namely taking Employment Ontario, Employment Works, you know, ODSP, and putting them into one pathway. And not only that, but moving them from MCCSS, the um, ministry, over to the Ministry of Labor. So some big, big changes. Um, the second big change was to divide the province into 15 different catchments. Um, so really uh, taking Ontario, dividing the map up, and what they've done um, is also integrated a or involved a service system manager. So those 12 out of the 15 catchments in Ontario have already gone through this transformation. Um, the Toronto area under which Community Living Toronto falls has not gone under this transformation yet, and we anticipate this to happen next year. But what the ministry have also done is they no longer provide the direct relationship with service providers. So instead, there's a there's an intermediary we call the service system manager that helps with those relationships. And the third shift, uh, which is a big one, is a shift to a performance-based funding. Uh, I won't get into the nitty gritty of that, but there's really a new model that they feel will promote more retention and accountability for service providers. So why is this important to my community living in Toronto? Well, it's important because part of this transformation also included deciding that employed be defined as working more than 20 hours a week. And for the individuals that we support, that's a real challenge as 50% probably do not work up to those 20 hours. So we went to the Ministry of Labor and we presented them with two ideas to offer a solution to some of the challenges we're seeing. And in, the two ideas were cluster and collaboration. So instead of a single job of 20 hours, why not allow a cluster of jobs? So an individual could perhaps work say two 10 hour jobs or smaller increments that, that would get them to the 20 hours. And then we also suggested that perhaps we could move the employment model to something that's more collaborative and move away from competition. So they decided that perhaps this is a good idea and um, they gave us a very significant grant um, to take this a step further. And this is how we came up with my job match. So next slide. So as we started the project, uh, we wanted to anchor it on these four values, inclusion and belonging, empowerment, efficient, effective, and seamless collaboration. So inclusion and belonging, we wanted my job match to be a trusted, caring, and inclusive experience for the job seeker, for employers, and employment supports professionals. Uh, we wanted job seekers to be empowered by choice of employment opportunities. Uh, we wanted a tool for our employment supports teams that would make their jobs more efficient and effective so that they could focus on the high value, high touch tasks. And then we wanted to build connections and have seamless collaborations between our agencies, job seekers and employers. Next. So my job match, we built out it 
first of all, for employment support professionals. So it's a database that evaluates the skills and interests of job seekers and against the keywords of employer that employers are looking for. And it provides more opportunities uh, through a public job listing. And for job seekers, my job match and employment supports teams work together to create profiles based on skills and interests and the number of hours worked. And it also is for employers. Um, my job match helps employers find candidates that are aligned and motivated to work with their organization. And it can capture what employers are looking for and match them with the right candidate. Next. So what is my job match? It's a new employed, employment um, supported employment process along with a digital tool. Because of those challenges I first mentioned around the employment transformation in Ontario, we needed to look for a new way to offer supported employment. One that's more effective and efficient. So together, the new supported employment process and the digital tool can take the administrative burden off our employment supports teams and provide them with additional support. Next. So the digital tool, um, these are the three foundational elements on which the database is, is created. So the top priority being location. So what the database does is it looks, uh, takes a look at employers and job seekers, postal codes, and makes employment suggest, uh, um, suggestions based on proximity. It also factors in skills and interests of the job seeker and employers to make suggested employment opportunities. Um, this next slide is actually a video demo of the um, My Job Match tool, so hopefully that'll work. I don't hear any sound. No sound, okay, not a problem. We'll keep going. Essentially this video, it really gives you an uh, oversight of some of the key features. And as you can see here on this, on this screen, it's really, it's a very intuitive looking um, platform. It's broken down visually into three sort of components. Uh, the individuals we support, the job opportunities network wide and employers. So the uniqueness of my job match really is on the jobs open network wide. Um, so previously jobs between uh, jobs would be um, contained within one agency and not shared. So this platform, it's a shared opportunity of jobs um, so that for instance, if Community Living Toronto and Corbrook, who is already a partner in this project, um, they both have the ability to see jobs on this network, which ultimately uh, goes to finding, um, assisting our job seekers with more uh, employment opportunities. Next. This would be, this is a slide that gives a brief overview of what a profile is for a job seeker. And it's fairly kind of small font, but underneath the name there, Jeff McDonald, the no, McDonald, no relationship. Uh, it looks like Jeff, it shows his work hours are six of 15. So the My Job Match tool is able to track the um, hours and individuals working. So one, this is great for the ability if, if this person, for instance, Jeff, he's open to work. So you can build more job um, possibilities based on the increment there that he's looking and open to work. And it's also a tool really, um, and this aligns with some of the um, changes that have gone on in Ontario with the increase to ODSP. So employment supports um, can track the people they're supporting and help them leverage that opportunity. Next. This is an example of a job. So um, again, very intuitive looking. It, 
this is a, a job opportunity of early morning stalker. Uh, that sounds funny. The, the job is open and it's in person. And one of the unique, another unique aspect of uh, this platform is the tag to the employment support lead. So based on the collaboration, individuals uh, or employment supports professionals can then reach out and collaborate between agencies to learn more about these job opportunities. Next. So this is the this is the platform to date. We have 292 jobs. Um, we have 470 employers participating, and we have six collaborating agencies as now part of the platform. So we're growing and we're pretty excited about that. Next. And this is coming soon. This has been a, a big part of this a past year is creating a B2C product. So what that means is that we're opening up the platform so that job seekers with a disability can take the employment journey themselves. So this is really a start to finish process. And if there is support needed um, on that journey where they're in the background, but stay tuned, this should be launched in the next few weeks and we're pretty excited about this feature. Next. Thank you, everybody. Um, sorry, the demo video didn't work, but I'm happy to share it. And if you want more information, just please reach out to myself or you can visit our website, um, myjobmatch.ca. And there's an interest form there that you can complete and you'll hear back from one of our team members. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for shedding some light on my job mat. And we are glad to know that it's growing. We encourage you to visit myjobmatch.ca to learn more. I think the contact details are available and will definitely circulate at the video as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. Up next, we'd like to welcome a very special guest for today's fireside chat, Mark Wefer. Mark Wefer is the former president and CEO of Abilities Canada a full inclusive sports complex and inclusion incubator. Until recently, he was the owner of 14 successful Tim Hortons restaurants in Toronto. Mark is an internationally recognized expert on economics of inclusion, is an advisor on both the Government of Canada and the Government of Ontario, is responsible for Canada's national disability employment strategy, as well as the reform of basic income for Canada's disabled, is also an honorary Canadian citizenship official. Mark and his wife Valeria are best known for their restaurants hiring practices with almost 250 workers with disabilities employed over 25 years. He is a member of the Rotary Club of Bellington North and a co-founder of Rotary at Work, a successful vocational initiative for Canada's disabled workers. A prolific connector of people, he has also won many awards, he is also a race car driver and a 2008 Canadian historic sports car champion. Welcome, Mark, and over to you, Brad, for host, to host today's uh, fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Petronella. Good afternoon, Mark. Really thrilled to have you join us this afternoon. I know this being Disability Employment Month, you must be in great demand. So thanks for taking the time to connect with us this afternoon. My pleasure to be here. Great. Now, you, a couple things about uh, Petronella covered a lot of ground in your introduction, and you're quite uh, accomplished over many, uh, many years. Two things jumped out at me that I, I wouldn't mind hearing a bit more about. Um, your involvement with Rotary, and I know your wife has had significant, that's something you've done together. I wouldn't mind hearing a bit more about that. And then sports cars, what's the deal with that? How does that fit into your life? <laughs> it's interesting, these are the things that popped up. So, uh, <laughs> yes, our, our whole life revolves around Rotary International at the moment. Rotary is one of the world's largest service organizations. And up until last year, my wife was the vice president, the global vice president of Rotary International. So. We do a lot of international travel, a lot of projects. Uh, polio eradication is our number one uh, project. We're very close to eradicating polio in the world. And at the club level, back in 2009, I started a program along with uh, a gentleman by the name of Joe Dale, who will be well known around community living. And we started a program called What We at Work. And we encouraged and Rotarians in business and those Rotarians who had control over hiring practices that they were 
places of employment to hire people with disabilities and real jobs, uh, meaningful positions, real jobs for real pay. And uh, from 2009 to 2014, uh, we actually uh, created 1,500 jobs uh, across wow. the country with the Rotary Work Program. So that's Rotary. Uh, motorsports, I spent my entire life with motorsports. I grew up with the sport, uh, became a licensed driver back in the early 80s, and won a championship in 2008 uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Porsche Turbo. So uh, it's a big part of my life. I'm retired now. Uh, my wife is very happy that I'm retired from that sport. It can be quite dangerous, but uh, yes, I uh, spent, uh, spent my entire life with it. And, and, uh, uh, Great love for motorsports and for speed. Uh, for speed too, eh? that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah, you need to be going quickly because you you do a lot. It sounds like uh, over the course of a day. So, um, for so for twenty five years, you operated Tim Hortons restaurants in and around Toronto, uh, and during that time, you employed about two hundred and fifty workers with disability, many with intellectual disabilities. Uh, and I gather that was in all areas of the business, including management. So yeah. when you began that, taking that on as an opportunity, um, you began working with Community Living Toronto as, as one of the uh, early organizations that uh, supported you. Can you talk a little bit more about how Community Living Toronto uh, provided support and what specifics or programs or services that, that uh, we provided uh, came to mind? How did it make a difference? Well, it all started uh, basically in the first week when I opened our first when we opened our first location on Markham Road in uh, Scarborough back in the early nineties. Um, I had the need to hire somebody to look after my dining room. A gentleman who walked through the door and applied for the job was uh, a young man named Clint Sparling, who a lot of us uh, remember that name. Um, and Clint was twenty three years old, just out of high school. Clint has Down syndrome, and as a deaf person, I'm a de- I happen to be deaf. I knew that there were great barriers towards him finding a job, especially if he was knocking on doors. Uh, so I took a chance and I hired him, but I didn't have the time to train him. Uh, first week in business, uh, I needed to find a way to to get help. And I, I, I discovered Community Living Toronto. And job developers and job coaches came out and helped me. And they were just absolutely wonderful. It's been a lifelong relationship with Community Living Toronto as a result. Uh, Clint uh, very quickly became my best employee. And I think we all know the story of Clint Spurling. We all know the history. He was the one who started it. He was my best employee. He came to work early. He wouldn't take a break. I wouldn't go home at the end of his shift. You know, the job meant that much to him. Um, and and, and so, But what was really important for us with community living was as, as we grew, and we grew fast. We had five restaurants in five years. Wow. Um, and we continued to add people um, most of them from community living Toronto, uh, people with similar disabilities as Clint, cognitive disabilities. Um, and and, and, and so from time to time, really, something may not work out or something may go wrong. And we didn't know whether it was the individual's job ethic or work ethic or if there was some other reason, um, health reason, for example. Because we were not experts on disability. We were experts on pouring coffee. We were experts on serving donuts. And what, what really worked well for us was to continue that relationship with Community Living Toronto. So it wasn't just a one-off where we, we, we onboard somebody and then we don't talk to Community Living anymore. It was an ongoing relationship. They were part of our recruitment process. They were part of our HR, uh, um, uh, uh, an extension of our HR department. And okay. they were able to provide provide us with, with key feedback. When we said, when we called and said, listen, something's not right here. We need your help. They were out within a few hours, and they were able to help us walk through what the issues might be. And in many cases, it saved the job. Or if the job wasn't working out, we were able to find work for that individual somewhere else. So that role that community living played as you're sorting out uh, the relationship with each individual employee was uh, was important to the success of your being able to do that over many, many years, sort of having that uh, third party that you could go to to help problem solve, to work with an individual uh, when it went sort of beyond what the expertise of your HR area was. Is that fair? That's absolutely true. And one of okay. the examples we can give, um, community delivering is actually responsible for saving the life of a young, young, young worker. 
Uh, many years ago, we had a, a person with multiple disabilities, including intellectual disabilities, who was a stellar employee working in the kitchen. Very quiet, very unassuming, uh, came to work every day, a great worker, and then one day uh, became agitated, and within a couple of days became violent. And we had no idea what was going on. We didn't understand what was happening. And in the normal circumstances, that individual would be fired. Being right. fired for violence in the workplace is unacceptable. We contacted the community living. The community living job developer came in, recognized immediately that there was a health problem, got that individual into a doctor, and x-rays showed that there was a brain tumor. Oh, wow. Yeah. And to call it early enough that within six months, that individual was back at work back to the same happy person that she was before. And if it wasn't for the in individual that came in the living, that person could have passed away from a brain tumor. That's, so, that's an amazing, that's a, I didn't know that story. That's an amazing, yeah. uh, an amazing story. We always yeah. say that behavior is communication for people that don't have great communication at times. So the fact that you've, that that story really speaks to that, that that's remarkable. Yeah. Um, you, you've been generous with your time around our 75th anniversary. So Community Living Toronto started in, uh, in, in 1948, uh, and you shared some stories with us uh, through, uh, through our campaign. And we've got your graphic that we let off with mm -hmm. uh, good representation of you. Um, you said in that story that it became clear that there was a business case for inclusion. So not just around, you know, benevolence and you're a you know, member of community and you recognized you, were, you, you had empathy for a person with a disability because of your hearing loss, your deafness, but you also recognize that, no, this is actually makes good business sense for me running my uh, Tim Hortons franchises. Can you speak to a little bit more about this, the sort of economics behind it, the business case that, that you came to understand and, and rely on? Well, that's really the key to success. So when you build capacity with people with disabilities, that's when you start to realize that there is a business case. We we recognized the business case around 1996, 97, when we'd hired about 10 people into intellectual disabilities. And we recognized that they were not taking time off. They were not calling in sick. They were not looking at the clock. Uh, they didn't require any supervision because they, you know, they were trained to do a job. They only do the job the way that they're trained to do it. And my wife and I looked at that and said, you know what? Starting to see something here. There's, there's lower absenteeism. There's, they're not leaving because the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. You know, there's, you and I would uh, move to another job for a dollar an hour more. And it wasn't the case with these individuals. Right. And so we opened our doors to anyone with a disability, as long as they could do the job or they could be trained to do the job, uh, any type of disability. Um, in the in the in, in around, around 1997 1998, we really uh, decided that this is just what we're going to do. We we set the tone, we set the intent. We were going to be inclusive employers because we saw something there. It wasn't just the right thing to do. But we saw something beneficial to our business as well, and we were right. And once we started to build capacity, absenteeism went way down. Uh, absenteeism was 85 percent lower for individuals with disabilities. 85%, uh, 85% lower. 85% every year. Wow. Because we had 250 employees, and 50 of them at any given time would identify as being disabled. And their right. absenteeism rate was 85% lower every single year. Safety ratings were higher because people with disabilities tend to work in a more safe manner. Uh, certainly the case with me as a deaf person, I have to be more aware of my surroundings. Uh, the innovation factor was off the chart. Uh, it's something that we really need to talk about with uh, other employers is to uh, people who have different problem solving skills, not necessarily better, but different problem it's solving different, skills, right. is, how, is how we create innovation in the workforce. So if I had 50 workers with, in, with disabilities, I had a more innovative workforce. And of course, for us being in retail, one of the biggest things for us was, uh, was our annual employee turnover. Uh, typically in a Tim Hortons or any other quick service restaurant, your employee turnover should be about 100% per year. That's typical, and you know it's it's entry level. It's, it's it, in many cases it's low pay, and so your turnover rates are, are typically fairly high. So 100 percent is typical, uh, but for us, for the last 10 years in business, it's 40 percent. And when you consider how much it costs to replace one person, 40 percent versus 100 percent, we were taking more money to the bank, and that's the kind of message that we need to uh, communicate to other businesses. And when I when I speak, and I do a lot of public speaking. Um, that's my message to other business owners. Don't look at this as the right thing to do. 
because you'll approach it the wrong way. You'll approach it as charity. Uh, don't look at it as compliance, because you know what? You're gonna if you do comply, you're gonna do so to the lowest common denominator. Look at your business critically. How can you have a gold standard of employment? How can you have a gold standard of business and bottom line returns? The best way is to be fully inclusive. And once we talk to them that way, they start to open doors. That's fantastic. Those uh, those numbers are shocking, and we we certainly uh, at Community Living Toronto uh, have had the same experience, uh, and have heard of many other employers uh, that have that have also had that experience. That's uh, that's very encouraging. The, you, now you you um, got out of the Tim Hortons business a number of years ago. Um, and sold your franchises or however that, I don't know how the Tim Hortons franchise world works, but you're not in that business anymore. Uh, you've since retired. Do you know how, if, if many employees have stayed with the Tim Hortons locations that you had brought on or, or how did that play out? Are you, are you able to speak to that? They had to stay. Uh, when we sold our business, we would only sell it to a buyer who would continue with all staff, whether they were disabled or otherwise. It was a condition of our release to a new owner. It's that they had to take all staff members. Now, what they do six months, a year, or two years later on, uh, it, it's, it's up to them. Uh, there's no law to say that they have to continue with those staff members. But I do know, uh, I have heard that many of the workers with disabilities are still employed. I drove through one of my own, my, my old drive throughs uh, a couple of weeks ago and in the drive-thru was a young man with autism who's still there six years later. And, and, and so, and Clint continued too, Clint Sperling. He continued on working in the dining room, uh, self-proclaimed uh, dining room manager now. Right? He's, not just a man, he's not just a worker, he's a manager now. Uh, Clint, just absolutely wonderful. But he's retired now. He's retired now. It's been okay. 30, 30 years on, he's retired and, and well-deserved. You you set the example for him by uh by by retiring. That's uh, yeah, that's good good mentorship. Um, now you as you were going through that and you you know hiring so many people over so many years, you started to see that there were barriers uh, to employment created by the system of ODSP and the way employment search goes for people with a developmental disability or other disabilities. And you took a pretty, maybe I could ask you a couple parts of this. One, what were the barriers that you saw? And then what were, what, what did you advocate for uh, to change that system? So in my opinion, the biggest, the biggest barrier was the clawbacks, the ODSP clawbacks. Uh, up until recently, you could earn $200 in a month. And then after that, you were clawed back at 50%. As a business owner who was hiring people with disabilities, these young adults, their parents would often come to us and say, well, you know, uh, Clint, for example, can only work two hours a day. Otherwise, it's the clawbacks are, 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 are too, too strong. And just, right. And just, just before you, so just so we're clear. So that means if you get your ODSP amount, say so I'll just pick $1,000 as a round number and it's been lower and I think it's a little bit higher than that now. Um, if you, you could, the first $200 that you made in employment, you got to keep the whole amount. And then okay. after the after you earn $200, uh, they would take, uh, every, you know, 50 cents out of every dollar uh, that you okay. earned in sort of a complicated formula, right? Did you not have to fax in your, your pay stubs or send them in and there'd be this sort of lag time and catch up for employees? So it was very disincentivizing, if that's a word. Uh, and it was also very cumbersome around the, the reporting. Very disincentivizing. Disincentivizing. Uh, you said it better than I did, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think we made a new yes. word, but yes, yeah, yeah. It, a real it, disincentive. It, it was a huge issue. Uh, parents would often pull their young adult children out of the uh, out of the workforce because of it. Um, I actually lost my best employee. I, I, I had a young, uh, not a young, not a young man, but a man who, who was young when he came to start working with me. He worked for eleven years. He was in charge of my logistics, so he would drive a van, but he looked after the other delivery vans. And this guy was just, just I mean, you, you just wish that every employee you have was just like this guy. And he uh, had multiple disabilities, but one of his disabilities was a physical disability and a new drug came out that would make his life much better. But in order for him to go on that drug, which was provided by ODSP, he had to go on ODSP. So I lost the perfect employee 
because of the system. The system right. created it. And, and what happened to him? He, he had to subsist on eleven sixty nine a month. Right? When he was making forty, forty five, fifty thousand dollars a year work, working in, in a real job. Right? So it, it, you know, the, the, the system certainly was dragging people down. Yes. So you you are pretty politically active as well. You uh, yes. uh, another passion of yours. Um, so you you did what you do, right? You got an idea. You 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 advocated and lobbied for a number of years around changes to both the ODSP exemption amounts uh, and some other things. Do you want to speak to to that and some of the success you've had in the last? Not just well, you, but the, the, some of the changes that have happened. Uh, yeah, in the there's, last, there's a in lot the of people year. who have been advocating for changes with ODSP. One of the things that we did a few years ago, uh, Pierre Polyev, who's now the, uh, the leader of the opposition, uh, he and I uh, launched a private members bill called uh, the Opportunities Act, uh, Bill C-395. And the idea was to force the provinces to uh, force or encourage the provinces to get rid of the club Act and to end a draconian uh, income tax uh, for people with uh, disabilities. Uh, it failed. Uh, it was a private member's bill. They often fail. Um, but it did have some effect. And by lobbying the provincial government, we've been actually been able to make some significant changes to the club act. As of March of this year, uh, sorry, February of this year, um, we now have club act that started at $1,000. So individuals on OPSP can now earn a thousand dollars of of income at work before there's a clawback. That's a significant change. It's, it lifts it's people huge, out, of, yeah. out of poverty, and it also removes that disincentive. You know, the parents are, are more likely to say, "Okay, son, okay, daughter, uh, we're comfortable now with you going to work because you can earn that thousand dollars before there's any clawback." That's that's the that's the, the biggest win that we've had in a long time, and I have to, I have to, you know, you know, there's there's a, there's a lot of things that uh, our governments don't do right, but when it comes to making that big change, I have to take my hat off to the Ford government and to the Minister of Finance in particular for making the decisions uh, that have changed the lives of so many people with disabilities. Yeah, and, and you're 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 modest. Um, I uh, so maybe I'll just speak to that for a sec. Um, the way uh, the budgets are in in uh, in our system of government are very confidential until they're released. Right, they're released after the stock market's closed. There's a lot of uh, sort of a, a drama, I'll call it, that goes along with them. But uh, at times, when there's something big happening within a particular sector, people are invited in to be given a heads up that something's coming so agencies and organizations and individuals can get behind a, a situation. So in February, um, uh, myself and a number of other people got a call to join a call in the morning uh, around some changes that were coming. Uh, and when we popped, when we came into the, to the call, it was virtual. Um, I was thrilled to see your face in the room with the minister speaking to the changes that were coming uh, around one, the exemption to the clawback uh, or the, the increase of the exemption from two hundred dollars to a thousand. Uh, I think you you know, all of these um, changes that happen within government need a face and a strong advocate. And I think you've played a big part in being one of those one of those people. The other big change that happened was the the, the government indexed uh, ODSP to the rate of inflation, which yes. was another another big change. Do you want to speak to that for uh, at all? Yes. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we fought for for a long time is to uh, in, increase the uh, ODSP to the level of inflation, to the level of uh, uh, the cost of living index, for example. Right. Um, and to start that off, the Ford government decided to increase uh, ODSP by 5%. So that was a one-time 5% increase. And then annually after that, it would be increased by inflation and cost of living. Right. So again, it's, uh, it's uh, and we have to remember, though, that that 5% is still 5% of a very small number. So it's still, yes. you know, those who are not working, those who are not able to go out and earn that $1,000, for example, um, it does keep them in poverty. There is also federally the uh, Canadian Disability Benefit, and I know that you're uh, you're involved in doing some uh, 
uh, some advocacy and lobbying around that as it ties into, because there, there is the potential that the disability benefit will come out and it may be clawed back by provincial governments who see it as a benefit over and above as opposed to part of building up an income. Do you have any thoughts on where you think that's going or any advice to us as we uh, keep our eye on that le piece of legislation? I guess it's in the point now that regulations are being developed. That's true. Now, the federal government uh, has, uh, no, if you, take, if you take a look at the pandemic, uh, the government proved to us that $2,000 a month is what we needed to live on. That's how much CEOB was. Uh, they came out with that right at the beginning, we need $2,000 to live. Well, who are they speaking to? <laughs> they speaking to non-disabled Canadians because when they looked at the disability, uh, disability community, they said, no, you don't qualify for this. You're already making eleven sixty nine a month in Ontario. You're going to have to stick with that. Well, that was that was unfair, uh, but it showed us, hey, two thousand dollars is the minimum that we require. And I think this is what we keep talking to the federal government about: is if it's eleven sixty nine in Ontario plus the five percent that we got this year, what are you putting in to make sure that it is two thousand dollars? What is the guaranteed right. benefit that a person with a disability who can't work? To no fault of their own, what is the amount that you're going to put in? Because it needs to be two thousand, it needs to be twenty two hundred dollars, and then it needs to be indexed to the cost of inflation and the right. cost of living. Great advice. The, politically, these days things are very polarized. So you know you're either Team A or Team B or whatever it might be, and um, uh, it's very hard for people to sort of get along and talk to each other. Um, you've got a different sort of way of approaching uh, politics that way. Do you have any advice for uh, for myself and our organization and others who are watching here around how the best way to make political change is from your experience? Well, parties change. And when an election comes along, who knows who you're going to be in? Uh, you need to have friends on all three parties. You need to have friends in all levels of government. And that's not just the two main levels of government. You gotta have friends in the municipal government as well. Because the pressure that's put on, uh, it works. Uh, when you when you, you talk to government and, and you uh, praise them for what they've done right. Because they get a lot of negative. They got a lot of negative media attention. They get a lot of negative feedback. And they close ranks. But when you sit in a room and you say to them, listen, I want to congratulate you on what you've done. And I did that with, with the provincial government. I did that with the federal government, right? Two completely different parties. Uh, when I was talking to uh, MP Karina Gould uh, from the federal government, I congratulated the government on what they did for Canadians during the pandemic, right? And there's a lot of criticism of what they did for the pandemic. But they saved people. They saved people's businesses. They saved people's jobs. They saved people's income. People were able to live in their homes. They were able to pay their mortgage because of the decisions that were made by the federal government. So we've got to praise them. It's one thing to knock them down and say, hey, you got to do more. And when it comes to ODSP, I have no problem knocking on a minister's door and saying, you know what, you got to do more. Thank you for what you've done. But you got to do a lot more now. Our expectations are that people with disabilities in this province and beyond live a full and comfortable life, whether they work or not. That's a great point, a full and comfortable life, and completely agree that uh, it's not an easy job being a, a, a member, a, 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 an elected uh, politician these oh. days, federally, provincially, you're knocking on doors all the time, you're generally criticized for things that, uh, that go wrong and not given praise for things that going right. So I, I do agree, I think it's important to say uh, thank you to recognize people's uh, contributions and uh, and that's proven yeah. to be effective as you're saying and we've we've experienced the same thing. Yeah. Final question as you know we're 75 years uh young at this point uh and we've been asking everybody that's come uh to chat with us um what belonging means to them. Belonging has been a real theme. Uh, beyond just including being included in your community, but that sense of that you're you you belong where you are, you belong in your communities. Mark, what does belonging mean to you? That's a great question, Brad. Uh, when we've talked, we've talked about what does belonging mean to us for years, uh, because we look at people with uh, disabilities who come to work for us, and you see the change in their lives when they have a job, when they have a job, when they have a paycheck. 
when you know they come to me or they come to their manager after a couple of weeks at work and they're showing them the pay stub and they're showing them that little line that says uh, tax deductions. And for you and me, we look at the tax deductions and we get a little upset. But people with disabilities who've been trying for years and years to get a job, they finally look at that and they say, you know what, I'm contributing to society now. I'm not sitting on the sidelines receiving 11.69 a month. I'm actually contributing to, to society and it has such a profound effect on, 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 on employees, especially those with intellectual disabilities, those who understand what this really means. To me, belonging means living your life to the fullest, living your life to the absolute fullest, to the top capability that you are able to do so. And in many cases, that means having a job, a real job for real pay. That's great. Great, great definition. Um, you've been generous with your time this afternoon. As you said, I know you've talked about you've been doing a lot of speaking and doing a lot of uh, podcasts of late. So uh, yes. thank you for your generosity of time. And also more broadly than that, thanks for being such a leader in the employment space and especially employment with uh, uh, for individuals with a, a disability and a developmental disability. So um, thank you very much. And we'll have to get together for a coffee again soon. And uh, catch to. up on everything else. Love to. I know a place. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Brad. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for joining us uh, today. And thank you for sharing your experiences. And thank you for championing inclusion and for advocating for many issues that impact our sector. We cannot thank you enough. And thank you, Brad, for facilitating that conversation. With the flu season around the corner, the health and well-being of our staff and community continue to be of utmost importance. We have recently launched a respiratory awareness campaign to prioritize the well-being of our staff and loved ones. To kick off the campaign, we hosted a webinar featuring Dr. Venita Dubey, Associate Medical Officer of Health at Toronto Public Health. Starting today, we can receive a free flu shot and most recent COVID-19 vaccine at local pharmacies, public health units, and and primary health care providers across the province. Staying up to date on vaccinations continues to be the best way for us to stay safe and healthy and avoid unnecessary visits to the hospital. I would like to welcome Gada Oma, Occupation Health and Safety Specialist, to present key highlights from the webinar and the things we can do to stay safe and healthy. Over to you, Gada. Thank you. Thank you, Danella. Hi, everyone, and thank you. Um... Hi everyone and thank you uh, for having me today. Uh, as uh, exactly what Petronella said, we started our campaign with uh, respiratory uh, webinar. I'm just gonna give here kind of highlights about the where are we standing as CLTO the notice of occurrences, which means the number of positive cases that tested during the month of October. We had around 20 uh, positive cases between 13 employees and seven uh, individuals we support. Uh, we had uh, nine cases with symptoms related to COVID-19, but still tested negative, seven employees and two individuals. We are still in a very good condition, but we continue monitoring. Next, please. So our respiratory campaign had four components or four areas. So we a webinar, uh, PPE, which is uh, personal protective equipment, infection prevention, um, uh, education, and N95 mask fitting clinics. Next, please. Our kickoff for the respiratory campaign was with a great webinar presented by Dr. Benita Dubey, Associate Medical Officer of Health Toronto, from Toronto Public Health and mediated by uh, Nicole Welch, Director and Chief of Nursing Officer from Toronto Public Health. Great webinar with a lot of information about the flu season and COVID-19, um, uh, providing with advices from Dr. Uh, Benita, how to stay safe, Next, please. With also different types of eligibility for treatments before getting the symptoms that you can know where, uh, if you are eligible or not by those resources, contacting uh, number uh, 811. Next, please. 
and also providing vaccine availability, clinics, uh, locations, and how to book online. So stay uh, up to date with the vaccine. So stay up to date with the vaccine. And if you need any guidance or any support with that, please reach out to Occupation Health and Safety and we will be supporting with that. Uh, before I forget, the recording of the webinar is available on our YouTube channel and our social media. If you did not watch the webinar already, please watch. The second area we are focusing on is personal, protect, personal protective equipment. We, secure, we make sure that all our sites and resources have available um, PPE, have available rat testing. So we continue our safety measures. We make it available for all our staff, for all our visitors, and for individuals we support. Um, that's part of our campaign and containing safety. Next, please. Our commitment for uh, our staff to be fully educated on infection prevention and control. We continue the, educa the education journey between hand hygiene, doning and doffing, cleaning and disinfection, uh, disinfecting, infection prevention control, training on N95 uh, masks they use and the fitting process. And that's our commitment to our teams. Next, please. Our N95 respirator fit. So through a, a great program through the ministry, we had till now for the last for, for the last month four mask fitting clinics. Up to 120 of our team has been N95 fitted uh, through the clinics. We have our team from Community Living Toronto as mask fitters. Up to 50 and plus staff has been fitted. Next, please. Just wanted to share with you this interesting graph. It shows the uh, time of infection based on the tif different types of mask between a source, someone who has COVID-19 and another person who doesn't have it. So it shows the leakage between, so if you look at the fitted test um, N95 mask, the leakage is 10%, although for a surgical mask, it's 50%. The timing, if both, parties are wearing fitted 95 mask can be safe up to 25 hours. Although without wearing a mask within 15 minutes, you can get infected. That's why we encourage everyone to stay safe, evaluate the situation and put the measures of safety, consider it. Next. And please remember, protect yourself, stay up to date with the vaccine. If you are sick, stay home. Um, wear a mask in crowded places or if you feel that you are need you if you are sick or you need to be uh, or if you are around people who are not feeling well and continue hand hygiene thank you thank you so much Gada. we'll definitely uh, circulate the link uh, to the webinar along with the recording uh, for today's uh, meeting we really thank you for that. Uh, my sincerest thanks to all our presenters today. And uh, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us and everyone here for joining us. Our next family and friends update is going to be on November 27th. So if there are any topics you would like us to address, please let us know. We'll also circulate a survey to get your feedback on these updates, which will help to inform uh, future, future meetings. So once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon and have a great day. Thank you.